Hello, child of God. There are roughly one half billion tongue-talking Christians on the earth today. That is roughly one-fourth of the Christians in the entire world, which also means there are roughly one and a half billion Christians that do not manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of this video is to address some of the wrong information and teachings concerning the gifts and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ addressed the wrong teachings of the Sadducees and Pharisees with scripture and authority and the manifestation of miracles. Many religious people rejected his words and went on in error, but some listened and waited in the upper room for Almighty God to pour out his Holy Spirit upon them. Now, when I was a child in Sunday school and heard about Peter and Paul and the manifestation of miracles, healing, and deliverance, I was so astonished at how great these men of God were. And I thought, we really need some people like that today. My focus was on the greatness of the men as Christian superheroes. I did not understand at that time it was the Holy Spirit that they were baptized with that was the real superhero living in the body of a plain human, like a hand in a glove. And God's plan is to baptize the entire church with the Holy Spirit. So strap yourself in now for a roller coaster ride of scriptures concerning the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If the information is presented to you too fast, just take the ride again. Like any other roller coaster ride, the introduction and background is a slow, slow climb to the top and then an exciting ride downhill. So let us begin this climb to the top with background information that you may already know. And I'm speaking truth and love when I say that Almighty God wants you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receive the gift of speaking in other tongues. The scripture tells us a lot about praying for each other and praying often. The scripture also tells us that Almighty God's plan is that each of us pray in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives us the words. Just think about the advantage to your prayer life as I give you this example. The Holy Spirit speaks to your human spirit and not to your ears, but he tells you to say, Father God, I ask you to heal my mother of the cancer growing in her brain. But that prayer is in a language that you do not consciously know. So your brain does not understand what you're saying. Your mind does not interfere with God's plan by panic or unbelief or pride or the things you do not know or interfere in any other way. Almighty God hears the prayer and instantly heals your mother's brain cancer before it damages her. It is similar to the Holy Spirit sending a secret coded message to Almighty God using your voice. Since God's ways and thoughts are higher than ours, as the heavens are higher than the earth, our thoughts and ways are incredibly insignificant compared to his prayers. Because Almighty God created the real you as a spirit that lives in a body made from dirt. He created you as a special person that he loves, and he wants to be your friend. As you know, your life does not end when your body dies. Your human spirit will continue on, but you will have to account to Almighty God for all of your actions while you were living in your body. Almighty God knew that many of our actions would be so evil that we would never be able to be his friend after our body dies. Almighty God loves you so much that he developed a plan to forgive us and to include us as his friend forever. True Christianity is not a list of rules or religious duties to perform, like bowing, giving to the poor, praying, and kissing the statues. True Christianity is that your human spirit believes in Jesus so much that you accept Almighty God's invitation to be your friend. You accept the invitation for His Holy Spirit to come and live with you in your body. If you do that, then he will give you eternal life as his friend and adopt you like a son. So let's start at the beginning. Within eternity, before anything else existed, a spirit we call Almighty God existed. In the eternal darkness before creation, Almighty God divided himself into three persons. We identify these persons as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit divides himself into seven different manifestations. Hello? Hello. Who made God? Is there one, three, or nine gods? 
The answer to your question is that there is just one God that chooses to reveal himself to mankind in several different manifestations. Almighty God is one God that has no beginning and no end. And what we know and understand is that humans do not have the ability to know and understand how Almighty God can exist without a beginning. It's just like if you ask an ant or a bee to explain how cell phones work, they would not have the mental ability to understand and explain that science. And no human being has the mental ability to understand and explain how Almighty God exists. It is a spiritual truth that is accepted by faith. We can each see the universe around us, and it just does not take any faith to see it. But how the universe came into being from non-existence cannot be explained by any science. Scientific theories about the origin of the universe always begin in the faith that something began to exist out of nothingness. And just as mankind cannot understand and explain scientifically how the universe came into existence from nothingness, no human can understand and explain how Almighty God exists. We have faith that He exists. And then we add to our faith the knowledge that comes from our relationship and our friendship with Almighty God. It is a truth that is accepted by faith. At some point in eternity, Almighty God manifested as the Son, spoke these words, Light be. And instantly he created the universe of over 50 billion galaxies, and each galaxy with over a billion stars. And as I said earlier, this is just a summary of events. Within his creation is his home, and we call that place heaven. It could be a planet, but we just do not know what it is. In heaven, he created many other spirit beings to live with him. Each one is vastly different from the other. Most of these we call angels, but he also created other spirit beings we call cherubim and seraphim. During the times of creation, Almighty God created the earth with all the plants and animals. And on the earth, he created a beautiful garden. He then created a human spirit person that was a lot like Almighty God. The human spirit is not male or female, but neuter like the angels. Then God took dirt and created a body for that spirit and breathed the human spirit into the body, making the first man. He then put the first human to sleep and took a rib from that man and made a woman. Almighty God would visit his garden in the evenings and walk and talk with the first two humans. Meanwhile, in heaven, one of Almighty God's created beings, a very special cherub named Lucifer, decided that he wanted all of what Almighty God had created. He began to try to be a God higher than Almighty God. Eventually, one-third of all the angels in heaven rebelled against God and joined that cherub named Lucifer. Back in the garden, God had created two special trees. If you ate from the fruit of one tree, you received eternal life, and you could never die. The fruit from the other tree gave the knowledge of right and wrong. God told the first humans, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of right and wrong. The day that you do it, you will die. The cherub Lucifer came to the garden and made himself look like a snake. As a snake, he told the woman that she could be like God, knowing right from wrong. If she ate from the tree of knowledge of right and wrong, or as it is written in the scriptures, if she ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The woman ate the fruit and gave to the man the fruit so that he also ate the knowledge of right and wrong. When God came to walk with them that evening, he knew what they had done. And he cursed them and also Lucifer. And God told them that the offspring of the woman would defeat Lucifer, whom is now called Satan, and he's called the dragon. The human couple were sent out of the garden that same day so that they could not eat of the tree of eternal life. And that was the last day they ever walked with God. Since we are created as spirits and live in a body, life and death are really not relative to the days your body has on earth. Life is relative to your relationship with Almighty God. The two humans experienced spiritual death that same day. In other words, death is a separation between God and man. When any person comes to the knowledge of right and wrong, they die spiritually and have an eternal separation from God. The human spirits continued to live in their own bodies and reproduced children for many years until their bodies died. 
At their death, the angels came and took the human spirits to a special place to wait for the time of judgment by Almighty God. Since the human spirits knew right and wrong, they will be judged for their right and wrong actions. The first humans disobeyed the words of the true God and were obedient to the words of the false God, and this caused the first spiritual death. God will judge us for disobeying what we know to be right and doing what we know to be wrong, and our own actions will cause our second spiritual death, which is the eternal separation from Almighty God in the lake of fire. Hello? Hello. Does God throw babies into the lake of fire? No. God is a good God. Children and people whom have not reached the knowledge of right and wrong are not punished. Almighty God created the lake of fire to punish Lucifer, whom is now called Satan, and his angels, whom obey Satan. Almighty God's plan from the beginning was to give all of the human race eternal life and fellowship with him. Mankind was given a free will and the ability to choose to do right or wrong. Evil people that serve Satan instead of God are first judged and then cast into the lake of fire. But it is because they have rejected God and have knowingly done evil acts. But at the same time that Almighty God was cursing mankind to death for their sin, he was blessing them with his plan to remove all sin and give them eternal life with him. Let me take a moment to explain God's plan with the symbols of spiritual beings. Lucifer the cherub's plan was to take over heaven and raise his throne above the throne of Almighty God. He first deceived one-third of the angels in heaven to follow him and to serve him as a god. Then he deceived mankind during the time of their innocence. And mankind rebelled against God also. When a man's body dies, the man's spirit is taken by the angels to a holding place away from God's presence. That place is called death, hell, and Hades. But Satan himself had just walked into a trap set by Almighty God. A trap that was too simple for Satan to understand or believe. Satan's war against Almighty God continued for thousands of years and billions of mankind had passed into death. But during these thousands of years, Almighty God spoke to mankind over and over through his prophets and told mankind of their future and told mankind about the total defeat of Satan and the resurrection of everyone that died to the joy of their salvation. One day all of mankind will be resurrected after the first death and restart their lives on earth. The simple plan that Satan could not understand was a sacrifice because of the greatness of the love of God for the humans of this world. Mankind is a created spirit that lives in a body made from dirt because of the union between a man and a woman. But Almighty God visited a virgin woman, made her pregnant, and he placed the spirit of the Son of God into the human body. The angels called him Emmanuel, which means God with us, and Jesus, which means Savior. He is not a human spirit in a man's body. He's the spirit of Almighty God in a human body. Satan still did not know what Almighty God had planned. During the time that there was only one sin, Adam rebelled against God and brought the curse of death to all of mankind. But now on earth, Satan has a new opponent that cannot be defeated, the spirit of Almighty God in a human body. Satan continued his plan in trying to kill all of mankind. And he also made many unsuccessful attempts to kill the man-god named Jesus. Finally, in God's perfect time, he allowed Jesus to be arrested and beaten and suffer many injustices. And then God allowed his only begotten son, Jesus, to be crucified by the Roman soldiers on a wooden cross until he died. This was the sacrifice that totally defeated Satan. Satan had caused the murder of a person whom had not rebelled against Almighty God and was not under the same curse of death as mankind. The victories that Satan had enjoyed against mankind for thousands of years had all just been lost. Jesus was illegally murdered, and his body stayed in the grave three days, and then Almighty God resurrected Jesus from the dead. When Satan caused the murder of Jesus, the curse of God against Satan came into effect. 
Satan lost everything, all authority and power. And all authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. Jesus was given authority to the raise the dead and judge all of humanity and judge Satan and all of his angels. Jesus made a pledge to all of mankind. If anyone would believe that Jesus defeated Satan and was raised from the dead, if they were willing to turn away from doing evil and ask God to forgive them for their sin, then Jesus would forgive all of their sin and they would not be held accountable for any sin at the judgment. They would be raised from the dead and given a new body and spend the rest of eternity in a joy-filled relationship with God. However, the good news is that when Satan shed the innocent blood of Jesus, Almighty God received that innocent blood as payment for all of mankind's sins. However, for a man's sins to be forgiven, that man must believe in what Jesus did on the cross for him by his innocent blood. A man must believe it so strongly that he turns away from his sin and is baptized. Let's move to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The exact moment that the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ left his bloody, beaten, tortured body on the cross. There was an earthquake and the veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from all the people was ripped from top to bottom. It was this moment that the earthly temple became obsolete. Our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, has sprinkled his eternal blood on the holy altar in heaven. The altar in heaven has been cleansed with the eternal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God the Father was completely and totally satisfied with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and no other payment is needed and no other payment is wanted. The Holy Spirit has identified with the precious blood of Jesus on that heavenly altar and was sent by the Father on the day of Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago. The entire earth has become his mercy seat. On that day of Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago, the apostle preached a sermon from Joel chapter 2, verse 28, concerning one of those Old Testament prophecies about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, saying, These people are not drunk, as you suppose. This is what God meant when he said on the last day, saith the Lord, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. When you can understand the power of the blood of Jesus on the altar in heaven, you can also understand how aggressively the Holy Spirit is seeking you for baptism. He can see the eternal blood of Jesus on the altar. In Joel chapter 2, 28, Almighty God the Father has chosen all flesh to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The first mention of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was from John the Baptist. Can you imagine how powerfully he was preaching there in Matthew chapter 3 when he's preaching, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear from his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. I'll just condense what John the Baptist said. He said, I baptize in water now, but after me, the Lord Jesus Christ will baptize in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Jesus identified with his own death, his own burial, and his own resurrection when he consented to be baptized in water. The Holy Spirit came down upon him like a dove and a voice from Almighty God in heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, of whom I am well pleased. Awesome! I think it's also important to note that Jesus sent his disciples out to baptize in water, but he himself never baptized any person in water. When a born-again Christian is baptized in water, he's making a public statement to God, to God's angels, to mankind, to Satan, to all the demons, that he is identifying with the death, 
the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus chose all 12 of his disciples and then breathed upon them the Holy Spirit, commanding them to receive ye the Holy Spirit. This was an infilling of the Holy Spirit for power. But he also commanded these same disciples, minus Judas Iscariot, of course, to remain in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them. So now we see Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit upon them when he walked with them. And then later on the day of Pentecost, he baptized them in the Holy Spirit. You do not need a super spiritual, spooky, anointed pastor that can walk on water to pray for you to get baptized in the Holy Spirit because Jesus is the only baptizer in the Holy Spirit and not the pastor. Try to keep in mind the two golden cherubim in the tabernacle. Keep your faces looking down at the blood on the mercy seat. Don't let yourself be distracted or redirected from this truth. The eternal God can see the blood of the Lamb on the altar in heaven. He has already sent the Holy Spirit to baptize you. There is no doubt that it is God's perfect will for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that is your baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Regardless of the righteousness of the pastor praying for you, it is the blood of Jesus that has made atonement for you. This is also regardless of whether you have stopped gossiping or smoking or any of those other naughty habits that you're struggling with. When you become a born-again Christian, you are a sinner that Jesus has washed in his blood. What got you that born-again experience was not your own righteousness, but as a gift from God, unearned and undeserved. You simply receive Jesus by faith. Your sins are forgiven. Your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You were not required to prove yourself holy or deserving before you received the gift of salvation. So make up your mind now. There is no more payment needed or wanted for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of speaking in other tongues. You're a blood-bought child of Almighty God. You do not receive the Holy Spirit because you're doing things right, and you're not rejected by the Holy Spirit because you're doing things wrong. It is the blood on the altar in heaven. Remember Jesus' letter to the church. Jesus is standing at your door knocking, and you must just open and allow him to come in. He does not choose you because of your personal righteousness, which, by the way, is just filthy rags before the Holy God. There is no waiting, there is no fasting, there is no praising, there is no giving, there is no begging, there is no tarrying, there is no confessing, there is no other religious practice or religious exercise that will convince the Lord Jesus Christ to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and give you the gift of tongues. He has already said yes. He cannot say no. Almighty God sees the blood on the altar in heaven and said yes. He cannot say no to you because of the blood. The answer has been yes since the day of Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago. Can you really picture the Holy Spirit, whom is always in total agreement with the Father, telling the Father, Yes, I see the blood on the altar, but I have chosen not to give this particular Christian the gifts of the Spirit. No, I'm not mocking the Holy Spirit here. I'm telling you, maybe what you think to be true does not make sense. God did not single you out to not give you tongues or any other gift. The evidence of God's love is the blood. The evidence of God's covenant is the blood. The evidence of your salvation is the blood. The evidence of God's will is the blood. The evidence God wants you to receive the gifts of the Spirit is the blood. The purchase price was paid. The packaging was paid. The handling was paid. The shipping was paid. And Jesus is knocking on your door trying to deliver the gifts to you. Open the door to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray right now. Whatever you ask the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be done for you. If you wish, I can lead you in prayer right now. Just pray with me, but put your faith in God to work for you. Almighty God. Yeah, just go ahead, pray, pray with me, pray after me. Almighty God, forgive me my every sin, my every trespass, all of my doubt and unbelief, all the things I've learned wrong, forgive me. Wash me 
in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptize me now in the Holy Spirit and give me the gifts of the Spirit. Give me the gift of speaking in other tongues now and help me to speak the words now. I open the door to you, Lord Jesus, and receive these gifts from you as done in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, child of God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your spirit, not to your ear. Just speak out the words he's saying to you. Don't repeat after me, but I'm going to pray for you. Just speak out whatever he's saying to you. Whatever those words are, just worship him, praise him, speak it out. The word says you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do not defy the word of God. Just speak it out. There's a pillow of fire on you now. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise you, Jesus. Glory and honor and praise be unto you, Lamb that was slain. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.